find an old uh, clip on YouTube. <laughs> How old were you when that came out? 89, I would have been like 21, 20. And so you're underway, you've started a career. Um, yeah. Was your dad in the business? Was that the point of that stage? Yeah, my dad had been playing drums, uh, it's like session drums in, from the 60s, 70s. He played with uh, people like Doris Troy, uh, Bob Andy, Marcia Griffiths, wow. The Stones. He's, he's got stories about you know, being in the studio with Bob Marley as well. So he'd been about a bit. Um, but then he started his own uh, record label because he had a, a reggae band called Ja Lion. Yeah. And he wanted to put music out, you know, what happened to go through the major labels. Um, you know, put, pressing up white labels, stick them in a van and just driving them down the country and selling them to, to record shops. But you, of course, were this precociously talented multi musician, weren't you? Because <laughs> you basically you were born, you, your education was music driven, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, my mum got me into uh, instruments from when I was about eight years old because um, I didn't live with my dad straight away. Um, we lived in Canterbury. And yeah. I remember a guy coming to the primary school and saying, oh, he's going to teach brass instruments. And she's like, do you want to play something? I was like, well, okay, maybe I'll pick up the cornet. And uh, my next door neighbour had a, had a had a cornet um, <laughs> that she got out of her shed. It was this beat up rusty old thing. It had holes in it and stuff. I used to go with it in a plastic bag to school. But everybody else had these brand new trumpets and stuff. Um, but that was my first instrument. It's a glamorous I, life, isn't yeah, it? Abs absolutely. And then from there, I started learning percussion, guitar, piano. Was there a point, you know, were you four and saying, Mummy, Daddy, I'm going to be a star? <laughs> or were you 14 and saying, Mummy, Daddy, I'm going to... I mean, it, it, or did you think, you know, I, I may be playing in the in the London Symphony Orchestra, you know, third third trumpet? No, well, you know, I, I was playing in the, the Kent County Youth Orchestra. Yes. I became the uh, principal percussionist of that. And we used to play the uh, Royal Festival Hall yeah. every every year. And I remember saying to myself, you know, because you're at the back being percussionist, I said, you know, one day I'm going to be at the front. I'm going to be performing my own thing. And I've actually played the Royal Festival Hall twice now. And uh, But you ain't getting up the front with the kettle drums, no, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> but I've used it in my in, in my songs. Yes. But I we we also toured uh, Brazil in 86. And uh, one time we did a, 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 live, a live broadcast on TV. It was a whole orchestra and a big choir as well. Um, and it's like 200 people there. The next time we did a, a show was another town in Brazil. And somebody came backstage and he had this um, album by Milton Nascimento. Oh, and he said, um, here, I brought this for you because I thought you were the best on TV. And <laughs> that story has always stuck with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it was just one of them things where, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm a bit of a show off at heart. But I always like to perform Natural in front of people. Natural performer, yeah. Yeah, kind of, yeah. I think, yeah, we, could, I think of, we could yeah. say that. But yeah. I never came home and said, you know, not like coming out going, Mum and Daddy, I'm going to be you know, <laughs> a performer now. You know what I mean? It's just one of those natural things that happen. But how about that? Were, were you thinking yourself as a solo star, solo artist? Was that kind of where you, you know, because you, once you've got all that music in you and that ability yeah. in you, where do you go with that? Well, yeah, I mean, then I started writing my own songs. Yes. You know, in school, we used to have this fantastic uh, music teacher, Mr. Wade, who basically we didn't learn any music. You could do what you wanted. You could do your homework or whatever. But I used to sneak Yeah, for, for those of you who couldn't do music, they were the best two a hours at school ever. You could catch know, up on maths sky or whatever. Off, yeah. But I used to go off to the, to the piano rooms and just start like, writing my own songs. I was about 13, 14 when I started doing that. So obviously you're doing that, then you start singing them as well. Um, I didn't fa I didn't fancy getting a, uh, somebody else to sing them for me, so I just started to sing myself. How about the voice? Yeah, but yeah. When did you think you had a voice? Uh, I don't even think I got one now. <laughs> you know, it's taken me a You'll long time to get to this to this stage. I mean, I listened back to the first single that I, I wrote, uh, Mister Postman. And yeah, I hate that song with a passion. <laughs> I really do. And I always say to my dad. I even said to said it to him the other day. I was like, How, do you, how could you hear that I was going to be something in the future? You know what I mean? Because obviously back then fledgling singer yeah. just starting out um he just said oh, i just knew you know you just sound like you got it i'm like <laughs> if i heard a kid singing like i did did back then i'm like nah, no way you know what i mean but it's one of those things you just work at it and then you know something will happen how about writing your anthem 
at the very start of your career. This, There's and, nothing like this. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Did you think this might this is the greatest thing I've done, or oh my god, I've got to carry this around like a millstone around my neck? Oh no, it's it's um it's a blessing in yeah. disguise. I I feel you know going through my dad's record collection as, as you do, and um, I came across the Ohio players. Heaven must be like this. Yeah. Stick it on, I'm like, man. This is wow. You know what I mean? And at the time, you got to remember it was acid. It was acid house, sure, and hip hop kind of fledgling at the time. So it was, there wasn't anything to do with live music. It was all about sequences, sequences and samplers and yeah. things. I'm like, man, people should be listening to this. So I just thought, right, I'm going to write something that's like this. You know what I mean? So I put down the bass line, put down the drums, put down the keys, put strings down. Did basically all the music. Stopped about five o'clock. Went down the road, got myself a cup of tea, <laughs> came back, wrote the lyrics. Really? <laughs> and it was done in a day. And then uh, Best day's work you've ever done, eh? Exactly. <laughs> and then I basically made a cassette. Cassette kids, you you like Google that. We'll you know fill them I mean? in later, <laughs> exactly. shall we? Exactly, yeah. Wherever that Subtitles is. Subtitles this bit. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um stuck it on a, a ninety minute cassette, so forty five minutes of just that song. Yeah. And just listened to it over and over again. I was like, man, I'm not getting bored of this song. Then took it to my dad's office. Play it to him and his his friends as well. They're like, man, this is yeah. this is carrying on. So, like, we thought we had something there. Let's talk about the period, which is an intriguing one, because it's you making it, and yet it's sort of not you, which is the kind of RCA time, mm. the American deal. Yeah. So, so I, I guess that's what it was. Was it? There was a deal, wasn't there? Oh uh, yeah, I had a deal with uh, BMG RCA, and uh, lucky enough, uh, Mike McCormack put us in touch with different producers at that time. And also, that's when I met Leon Ware. I did, yes. I did a... Uh, Always good. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did a, a mid M festival where it was a tribute to Marvin Gaye. And me and Leon just got on like a house on fire from there and it ended up in LA. Did and... you introduce yourself to him? Well, it was kind of... He was the MD of the band. Right. And I was singing a Marvin tune. So, yeah, we had... Nice. We said hello then yeah. as well. But, uh, yeah, we ended, <laughs> ended up... Smoking and spiffing in the toilet. Shh, um, now. Yeah, yeah, anyway. But, um, we'll, we'll explain the kids we'll later on that, what that we'll is cut as that well. Out, yeah. Anyway, that was just for me and you. But um, yeah, I met with Leon and then uh, they put me in touch with Lamont Dozier yeah. as well, which was like, man, you know, one of the greatest songwriters in the world at the time. Um, Sarita Wright as well, I managed to get to work with. Of course, Stevie, I'd met back in the 80s and while I was in, in LA, I got to hang out at Wonderland. I, I feel obliged to say, Again, for the kids, Stevie Wonder, mm. just because you get Sorry. to call him Stevie, <laughs> doesn't mean we all do. Yeah. Uh, but he, so the American experience is clearly so beneficial on that level. It's, it's, it's meeting the greats. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've got to mention David Frank as well from yes. The Simpsons, uh, this, the system, um, because he, you know, he was instrumental in putting it all together in terms of the, the production and stuff. We worked on, we wrote a lot of stuff together. Um, and, you know... Imagine I'm there working with David Frank, and then Jeff Lorber comes around, say hello, and I'm like, "Man, can you play on my tune?" Yeah, like, yeah. And then we went to his house, and he's got Tower Power playing in the studio, round the back. Oh dear. Do you know what I mean? My mind was just blown by this whole experience. And then going with Leon Ware to the Roxy, and then you know the scene in Goodfellas where they take you through the kitchen and see yes. you at the front. It was like that. It was one of them moments with yeah. the, with with Leon. So, with all due respect to Canterbury. That it could not yeah, yeah. deliver this, could it? Really? Not quite. How how do you find, how did you find yourself working with those people? Because you're still a kid, you know. Yeah. You're a fledgling performer, mm. you know. You're a new artist. Mm. How do you how do you start having the conversation with Stevie Wonder about what you're going to do? Well, um, my manager at the time was Keith Harris, and Keith Harris um, manages Stevie in the UK. So it was one of those introductions. He um, gave him my second album, Music. And Stevie said, oh, I, like, I like your stuff. I wanna, I'm going to write you your first number one, he said. I'm like, I don't even care what number it gets to. You're going to write with yeah, me. Yeah, anyway. Fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> we ended up in the studio, but uh, it was we was on Stevie time. So it was, one, it, was one, it, was, it was like half past two in the morning. I'm talking to him, and I'm like, not talking to him because he's fallen asleep. So I had to wait until 2000 when I got the phone call. I'm like, to wake up. Yo, man, <laughs> yo, man, it's your boy. I'm like, who's that? He goes, Steve, oh, Steve, who? He goes, Stevie Wonder. I went, nah, wait, are you joking me? He goes, I said, sing something to me. And he sang down to me no. on the phone. Yeah. And then for two weeks, I was like, Stevie Wonder's ambassador, because we went to clubs, restaurants, um, studio, hotel, everything. We was just hanging out for the whole time. And then we went to the studio and um, put down a song. And then I got a phone call the next morning. He said, yeah, I've got another song. Let's go. 
that man, you know, what it, could I wish for? The thing about it is the beauty of someone like that is that you are literally with greatness. I mean, you're not even got to fake this, have you? No. I mean, this guy doesn't have to doesn't have to pay for anything ever again. No. Do you know what I mean? We we, we uh, he said he was hungry one afternoon. We we're like, yeah. Uh, oh, Stevie wants to eat. So, oh, like, let's call up some uh, fancy restaurant. Like, oh no, the lunch lunch service is closed. I'm like, did you know we got Stevie Wonder? And like, oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> oh yeah, the chef is there. So yes. we took it. You know, this guy can eat any any time for free again. Back from the talking loud days, myself, Incognito, brand new heavies. Um, we're all trying to do that. Uh, you know, retro style, yes. and that's the those are the writers, those are the musicians that we were trying to emulate in the first place. So to get to work with them firsthand was just something out of the blue. I mean, to to get Lamont Dozier's uh, backing tracks because we started working on a song together, and it was kind of like, nah, nah, what well, I'll, I'll take it you told him that, did you? Well, yeah, I was kind of like <laughs> really? not really feeling it, and then I went back to the studio the next day, and he's playing this stuff. I'm thinking, what the hell is this? And he goes, oh, this is some stuff I wrote back in 70 something now, but you know i didn't use it i'm like could you give it to me man they must hate it when they get like some <laughs> kid 20 years too young from another country is going yeah. this is it yeah well no i mean they do he's quite happy to give me he gave me like three or four backing tracks wow and the one that i picked was the one i used for outside when you talk about your musicianship and you and working people like stevie wonder clearly you've enjoyed collaborations is, is a big thing with you yeah you, yeah. you you never seen that you've always seemed to be interested in working with other people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's part of that buzz as well. I mean, it kind of takes the pressure off of me as well. Yeah. Because I am a little bit insular in terms of when I'm creating things. I I like to be just left alone, to, just to get on with it, and then to you know to do my thing. But then when you bring somebody else into the project, then you get a, you can you can feed off of each other as well. So you know, it works. And and you go out and do other people's projects as well, don't you? Which is the fun part. Of it, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, I, don't ask me to, to name names. I've well, I was going to say like the... Angie Stone, for example. I mean, you did be thankful. That yeah, was, yeah. But that was my project. That was your project. Yeah, yeah. And that was. But a... you get the ring up Angie Stone for that, then, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that I've been blessed enough that um, you know artists like that know my music. You know, yeah. I think it's one of those things where. Uh, musicians pass around CDs when on the tour bus. And they're like, no, listen to this, listen to that. So I get known throughout those circles, you know. And then I get the call, you know. I've, I've been called from uh, by Jill Scott, Erica, Angie, just coming over and saying, oh, they want to meet me. This is back a yard. Yeah. Which is at the back of my yard, funny enough. It's amazing how that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually seven years since the last time where I actually wrote the last one, Sing If You Want It. And um, yeah, it was time to 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 release some new music for people to hear. What was the but what was the process? Obviously, you knew. Oh, you, okay, as you say, right there, you go. That album's done. Mm. Are you like following dates? Right, I'm starting on the next one. Is that is that the way you no, want to go? No, it's always an ongoing process. Yeah. I mean, you know, the uh, funny enough, the last song that I finished for the album, which is "Treat You," with Karen Wheeler, was a, a snippet from the last album. Really? So anyway, I think the last nice. song was the first one. If you if you if you get me, um, it's 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 always an ongoing process, and I'm blessed enough um, to have my own studio where I can just if I get the inspiration, I can just walk in there and and, and start making music. I don't have to worry about paying the bill or do you know what I mean. If it, if I'm sharing it with anybody or anything like that, it's just there. All I need to do is go in there, and create the music. And so this album then. If you're evolving it over that period of time, mm. are you comfortable with the, the fact that... Are you thinking, like, I know my music's kind of got that time's quality. I'm not making a single which has got to be out in six months, otherwise it's dead. Yeah, that's the, the, the one thing. Like I said, going back to the first single, I, yeah. I always, I've always i always been conscious of just making some music that I'm, I'm happy to sing for a long time to come. I mean, you know, yes. imagine if I hated There's Nothing Like This. <laughs> that would have been Whoa. like, yeah, exactly. You'd that, be a very bitter man sitting here <laughs> exactly. at this particular moment, wouldn't the you? The albatross around my neck, you know yes. what I mean? So it's just, yeah, my music is, is supposed to be timeless. Uh, I've been told that it's that's what it is as well. You know, I've got stuff... I made you know ten, fifteen years ago. The people are still playing, playing now. They're still listening to now, and that's that was my sole intention is to to create something, and uh, uh, to create a legacy. You know that will that will last for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. <laughs> Things that I should not have done Just trying to be the 